very much and a warm welcome to the Immersive Language Learning and Virtual Worlds session. Here I'm delighted to be co-presenting with Helena Galani here to my left and with Annalisa Di Piero, who is soon here, and with Jennifer. Jennifer, who is, will be doing the transcribing of the text for everyone. Uh, she is our, um, yeah, speak easy helper assistant. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for being here. And also thanks very much to Nicholas Humphreys, who's doing the live streaming. And he's doing this under quite interesting circumstances. So I'm really, really grateful. Allow me to tell you what we will do in the next hour. I would like to present to you the results of our five-week workshop in January this year. Hi, Asen Robles from Spain. Lovely to see you on the live stream. Um, I would like then to pass over the word to Helena, who will be doing, um, who will present to us her work she does in virtual world, and she works a lot with children. And then we will also have Annalisa Di Piero tell us a little bit about the work she does in Edmondo, again, an open sim installation uh, that she's been working with. Is um, Annalisa, if you don't mind, perhaps, oh yeah, Annalisa, unfortunately, we couldn't get a third chair here on the main stage. Perhaps if you want to sit down in the main auditorium, when it is your turn, I will leave the seat and then you can sit down if that's okay. And thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer has been working as part of the team in the five-week workshop. And um, let me tell you about the workshop first, what we did. We said, we educators, we wanted to know how many virtual worlds, well, what kind of virtual worlds are out there and which ones of the virtual worlds are actually suitable for language teaching and learning. We are mostly language educators, but in this workshop, um, which was the TESOL organized EVA sessions workshops, there were 150 participants, mostly English teachers, but also other educators. And we engaged in over 20 live sessions with that one and only question that we had, which was which of the 3D solutions out there are suitable for language teaching and learning? And how can we decide to do so? We wanted to provide an overview of the wide variety of different worlds. And we wanted to do that before we actually delve into the virtual world, because every so often it is a big investment of time and resources to get to know one of these virtual worlds. So we wanted to know which one is actually does warrant our investment of time in getting to know it. The beautiful team of eight moderators, 150 participants, and this was as I said in the framework of TESOL America's EVO sessions, which is usually attended by some 3,000 teachers worldwide. What we wanted to do is we wanted to um, well, look at these, but what we did is we didn't actually join and enter the virtual worlds, but we had people who knew about certain environments come and join us in Zoom, share their screen and explain us all about it. Amongst others, we had Leah Lobo around, who is um, uh, who's a, a real expert in virtual worlds. Then, um, Leah Lobo, who uh, Dr. Cynthia Colon, many of you know, being a virtual world, uh, world of Warcraft expert, she presented to us. <laughs> um, she presented to us uh, World of Warcraft, and we looked over her shoulder as she demonstrated to us her environment, and she showed us the many different abbeys she had. She also explained us about certain studies supporting that language learning takes place, and. We did this with quite a number of people. And Gord Holden, for example, showed an active world. Um, a New Zealand teacher demonstrated co-spaces. And we 
in that time, we then filled in that evaluation rubric, which we came up with, and we just simply asked quite a number of questions like, well, is that virtual world free of charge? If not, how much does it cost? Or what are the system requirements? Can you enter it without a headset? Or do you need a headset, uh, like an Oculus Rift? Then not only what the system requirements are, does it run on a mobile phone? Does it run only on a PC? Is it browser-based? Does it work on an iPad? And then more so, we were interested in what can you actually do there? What kind of activities can you do there? Um, can you voice? Can you text? Can you role play? Can you customize avatars? Can you customize the environment? Um, we looked at things that are missing even. We looked at different, I mean, the evaluation rubric has is lengthy and we filled in that rubric as we went along um, over the period of five weeks, looking at a total of 13 solutions while discussing some 18 in total. And then uh, even after evaluating, the, the different virtual worlds, we then went on to try cider and put down the pluses and the minuses of each of the world, the worlds. And then we decided to, uh, to have a look, um, which would be our top five. <laughs> it, it sounds easy enough to, but to come to the top five that took us quite some time and quite some interesting discussions. Um, the sessions were attended to really nicely, so we had lovely, lovely uh, discussions amongst us educators. And if I gave you now the tri sider with the complete results, <laughs> you would know already which one is the top number one. And of course, when I now go through the slides and explaining you more of each of the solutions, I've got 18 different ones in question, then um, we will count down from 18. We don't start with number one, we'll just make it more exciting. <laughs> and later on, I will give you the tri sider link so that you can also look up how many voted and what kind of arguments that were placed. 18, yes. <laughs> so we will go down 18 from, well, we also have number 19. <laughs> now, it's the honorable mention, I would say, because sadly, high fidelity closed. Just as we were well, close in November, we had the session in January. So we first of all thought of it. Um, number 18 turned out to be Sunstar, interestingly, but not because it's a beautiful, beautiful world and it's, it's really large, but because um, Sunstar mainly is geared towards entertainment. Um, as many of you know, there's also almost no chance of being able to customize the environment easily. Um, the environment, not you have to know quite a bit of building skills in Maya and other um, vendor and stuff, but also customizing one's own avatar is also not so easy. Anyway, we, we more or less turned it down uh, because of um, being very, very marketing oriented towards the entertainment industry or the graphics, arts uh, kind of industry. And also it wasn't very pop populated. Um, it's a beautiful world though. And we know it was sold to Wookie and that announcement came in about two days ago. So it also caught, caught me by surprise. Um, number 17. That was Facebook Spaces. And for Facebook Spaces, which uh, only worked with the Oculus Rift, I purchased an Oculus Rift and I purchased a really fast computer. It both had to be. Um, it took me quite a bit of money and also a lot of time recalibrating the Oculus Rift every single time when I wanted to use it. Eventually, I ended up uh, this beautiful table. Well, we, I tried to find somebody with whom I could share this VR experience, and even that was difficult. 
uh, some clients asked me to demonstrate Facebook spaces, and I couldn't even find somebody at a distance who would do that with me, because nobody owned a risk, <laughs> not of our CC. And um, on top of that, I, I kind of messed up with the calibrator because I took the thing to, to conferences. At least I could sort of see what the people, when they were using it, sort of had problems with. And uh, eventually, I, I ended up with the table uh, raised quite high. In a, in a, I couldn't even get to the reset button of that table in Facebook Spaces. And I thought I'm clever would climb up some stairs in order to get to these buttons to reset the pen. I never got it reset. Honestly, I don't know how, how I messed it up. This It was funny, though. OK, uh, number 16, but still not out completely. Facebook Horizon, which is still in beta. And this is the funny world where people don't have legs. Well, I don't, we don't know what it's like. It looks very, very sort of Disney-ish, Disney World-ish. <laughs> um, also, we couldn't find anybody who would showcase to us Fortnite. We really wanted to know Fortnite. We asked around everyone, oh, please, can you show us Fortnite? And uh, nobody... Even though it's played by 230 million players worldwide, mostly teams, we couldn't find anything. Same like with Mozilla Hub. Mozilla Hub is the only, we figured the only browser based solution as VR social worlds out there. We are enabled, but it's also just, you can access it just via the browser. Beautiful. English talking to a chatbot. It's only a startup. It, I don't think it ever went beyond the pilot place. I mean, if you go to, to um, Street Steam, you don't find the second or a third version of it. And as I said, it was just a game. But what we found interesting was the chatbot idea. The language learn is absolutely beautiful. Oh, here comes number. Where comes the number? Well, friend base. Oh, that's gorgeous. Friend base. Thank you so much. <laughs> friend base is an app. It does run on a PC, it runs on a mobile phone. It's a cute little app. You can just start the app and you're in a 3D environment and you can start chatting to people. It's very good. Does anybody of you know friend base? Have you ever tried it? Yeah, sorry, Tim, 13 to 15, you were missing on the screen. Let me just recap what it was. 15 was Fortnite. 14 was Mozilla Hub. 13 was Play to Speak, a single player game with a nice chatbot. And we're now number 12. I'll catch you out there. I know the stream was off for a moment. Friend base is cute, but it doesn't have a lot of um, good reviews. You're welcome, Tim. Yeah, good reviews because, I mean, it only has like 3.3 of 5. Even though it's been downloaded many hundreds of thousands of times, and the reason is because there's no moderation of the chat. So there is a lot of foul language, and there's a lot of sexually induced language, and there's a lot of chatting up. She can private chat with each other. So there's a lot of uh, hooking on and whatever you call, call it. In this chat, Karen, not. No, um, I'm just watching the stream. Yeah, and then number. We're number 11. Yeah. 11 is immersed online. And that was really interesting because. Uh, Friend of mine, Lukas Palacek from the Czech Republic, came up with this as a startup from America. They created this Unity based 3D solution, and what they did was they actually added content in this 3D world 
which was essentially designed for language learning. So there were dialogues, there were also like scripts with uh, kind of first read the dialogue and interact with it. Interestingly, the teachers didn't have to have a headset to be in this world, but the students did, and the students had to use Oculus Quest. And unless they had the Oculus Quest preloaded by the company in America, they wouldn't be able to use this virtual world. And it turned out it wasn't a platform, it was a 3D world with what we call was great content and beautiful um, 3D imagery, uh, very variety, customize the other bar. Um, there was funny enough, there was no text chat, no free text chat. You could do the question and answers with the interface, yes, and with the teacher, but no free questions. And then um, it was it was later on found out that they're interested more in selling language classes and not really selling language learning solutions. Well, for us it was interesting to see, well, if we had really a lot of money, what could we possibly get in a 3D sort of version of uh, things? If we could dream up our perfect language learning environment, would it look like immersive online? Well, some of us said, yeah. Uh, number 10, and we're now getting nearer to the solutions that you probably also know. And perhaps if you could write in text chat where you know a whole space of your team in there, because from now onwards, we we'll, we'll, a lot of environments are familiar to us. Uh, so if you could just type in the text chat, yes, I've been in old space, and yes, actually the VR educators are in old space, and they meet regularly. And um, that's how we know it, and it's quite nice, to be honest. Uh, I never like the stickiness of the avatars, but the customizable chat works fine. You can meet, you can talk, and it, it's been going on a long time. Even though the graphics are poor, but there's really strong communities in old space, and as I said, it's been going for years. Yeah. So here we come to our VR chat, number nine. Has anybody of you tried out VR chat? Yes, James says yes. And how did you like it? Anybody else tried out VR chat? Apparently some hundred million users. 40% of which are, of whom are using VR headsets. It's funny because VR chat doesn't have a chat. <laughs> no text chat. <laughs> All you can do is speak in the solution, which is interesting because for language learning, something where you just need to speak and you can't even type is cool. So, and the funny thing about VR chat is it's so popular because VR chat is really funny. You can't customize the environment very much. I mean, you get your own space and uh, you can go to places, but the funny thing about VR chat is that you can customize on Abbey and really easily and really funny. And there's lots of creators in there who, who create with a special software development kit they create really funny avatars and what you can do there, you, you can look at an avatar and you think, oh, I like that one. And you can click on that avatar and you can say, copy. <laughs> and this made me change from a bear to a frog to a chicken to a medieval knight. And uh, within minutes, <laughs> it was so funny and it's awfully funny. It's just so hilarious. If you look at YouTube streams of your chat, you find one where the, the characters are just nothing but laughing. That's really cool. Anybody else try to your chat? <laughs> then, yeah, have you been in there? Your yeah, chat is really cool. I like it. And so, of course, yes, I think language learning is great, but as there are 
quite a few kids in there. You can hear from their voices the youngsters of 12, 13, 14, and just play around. They're also adults, and we don't know the minimum age. Oh, next one. We're number eight now. Science Face. Oh, we love Science Face. Yes, side arm. Have you been in Science Face? Who of you has been in Science Face? Well, we all should know it because Science Face, the, the developers of Science Face, Adam Christie's, he was one of the very first external lindens in the core development. Then they were the founding developers of Open Sim. Then um, they've been working in OpenSIM, yeah, well, yeah, they've been working in OpenSIM for years. And then seven, eight years ago, they started using Unity. And what they did cleverly now is they kind of used Unity. You have to have Unity as a software to import um, landscapes and buildings and everything. But you can import OAR files, which are OpenSIM files, obviously. OAR files with a special plugin from Science Page for Unity. And similarly, then um, you can um, in, science, in, in the 3D space, Science Page, they manage to create kind of an overlay of the Unity environment that allows people to interact with objects. So it's a little bit different. It's limited, but it's very, very cool. And it's been in each of the three years. Um, they've done great. They've done VR enabled. Then they've done mobile phones. Um, to work on these interfaces. And they said they will come out of beta in April, May this year with quite a new set of features. And they are the most promising well, I'd say kit on the block for a long, a long time. I've been looking at it. <laughs> uh, we, we're running out of uh, chairs, it looks like. Thank you, Jess. Thank you so much for subscribing. Anybody know Science Space? People around it, of course. You must know. So, and uh, the next one. Of course, you can see the preview always from what's going But Vina, a very interesting solution. Um, it's, it's a complete university type of space free. You can go in there and just form little work groups. And the, the display mechanisms is very much like a cool Adobe Connect or Zoom because you can easily upload, show slides, uh, whiteboards. Documents, Google documents you can work on together, have some white portals together, create breakout rooms. So the facilitation of class management and the presentation tools is really, really cool. It's very slick, very corporate looking. Really aim to be university style, but um, yeah, it, it's very cool. So be that. If you want to really sort of become subscribe things and just try the 200 a month. I don't know, you, US or Europe, because it's, it's quite expensive. So now we are getting six, number six, we're down. What do you think is number one, everyone? Keep thinking, what is number one? <laughs> so number six, actually six, I think, should be higher up. But um, now we've also noticed Oh, James is giving a, a good guess here. Yeah. Which one is number one? Uh, Minecraft is definitely not on the list because the children, we in language learning, children are a beautiful target group that we would like to reach. And we've done with the Quiver project a lot of lengthy uh, piloting phase of nine months with several schools. And we're very, very happy with the results, sadly. I mean, thanks to Minecraft Edu, a school not picking it up, but I'm saying sadly because still people, especially parents, are against the game-like environment of this solution. 
but it's fantastic, yes. So a K-12 couldn't agree with you more, Jess. So number five, what is number five? Well, <laughs> probably because of Lear, because she told us so much about World of Warcraft. <laughs> Little uh, presentation just threw everyone away, but it's also quite involved to work it. Um, yes, there's a group of educators in there, um, not sure about the language learning part, and yes, we loved it, but it's, it still is a handful to get to know it. We also looked at um, the classic World of Warcraft, which is very, very conducive to Rossi, and so it's very similar to what we know in Second Life to be. World of Warcraft classics been around, uh, well, just recently been re put on the market. <laughs> Obviously, this is how the first users of World of Warcraft remember things, but as I said, it came out, I think, last year again, the classic version. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not keeping very much to the script. Sorry, Beth. Yes. And uh, here we come with number four already in the field of work. solutions we really, really, really enjoyed. Uh, CoSpaces is based in Munich and they I approached them for some demonstration because we wanted to get to know it and they eventually said, okay, well, the 9 p.m. European time, the only way we can give you a presentation is by getting somebody from post bases in New Zealand. <laughs> so they had a teacher for whom it was nine o'clock in the morning uh, join us and he gave us a presentation and it was absolutely adorable. The interesting thing about post bases is it is a single player game if you start to play it. But it's a multiplayer game when you are in the creation phase. So students, and there's a free version around for one teacher and 29 students, they can collaborate on their different iPads and work to create things. It has coding capabilities, like Scratch, you know, very uh, sort of basic coding capabilities. It has uh, merge cube capabilities. It is AR and VR enabled runs on a mobile phone, it runs on an iPad. It's absolutely brilliant. It really is cool. And uh, then Annalisa, she said, oh, look, I tried at CoSpaces with my students and we found the amount of objects you can use to create 3D environments. It's very limited in the free version. What can we do? And the teacher in New Zealand showed her how to go on through a browser-based search in code spaces. Go to sites like um, 3D Warehouse or um, Unity Asset Storage, so I can't remember, but in quite a few 3D uh, uh, objects. And through that, you can import them. Yes, you can search for 3D objects online, import them and then you have a fantastic set of objects available for building. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Oh, and not surprising, comes um, number three now. And in my work, we all love, obviously, very much Second Life. And we were pleased to hear about all groups, and I have to stop a little bit my presentation now. But, um, Please to hear at Goldberg's uh, comments yesterday when he said they sold Sansar to the startup Wookie and they're very happy with Second Life and we want to refocus to Second Life. And um, the, the one thing yesterday during the keynote with Ebe and Pat Linden was uh, there was an interesting question by Katie asked, so what about shared media? And uh, as much as we love Second Life and every one of us really lives it and adores it, this is my home. Um, the one thing I can say 
is it's a nightmare to upload a presentation. <laughs> And I don't have to tell you about you you ID numbers that you put in the note card in the presentation hub, and then you have to pay for Linton. And <laughs> oh no, I don't go into this one. Okay. <laughs> oh, very very good question, Solina Astra about trolls and griefers, and also the security aspects. We looked in our evaluation definitely a lot. Um, one of the big questions we wanted to find out is it safe for our learners? Yeah, there's no straight answer to that, but there were quite a few of the worlds that were very conducive for language learning for the youngsters. Um, and we now refer to second life is an issue, also adult subjects. So active words, um, Gord Holden showed us, and some of us tried it, and we think it's something like the open sim with an added um, feature set that's fantastic for language learning, one of which is it's very easy to use text in this 3D environment. And it could be as simple as labeling objects, yeah? Um, Active words is actually almost as old as SL, but the difference, uh, I come to that why we will <laughs> come to our number one. It is run by a company, and active words is so strong and growing for many, many years, and lots of people have invested very time. What is very easy in active words is um, that you can, from a huge asset store within active words you can take objects and easily copy them modify them and make them your own out of a, an inventory of some extended proportions yeah so to create large landscapes full of objects from furnitures to buildings to a whole village is very easy in active words and as i said uh, also vocabulary training vocabulary drills uh, or to that display explanation and scripts. I have to go on because we have now number one, <laughs> and this is well one of the reasons we decided open is number one, even though Active Worlds was really that tick better and nicer and sweeter, was because with open sim we do not run into the problem of that somebody might decide to fold the company. You know, active world closes the company, all the worlds disappear. When Google Lively closed, Google Lively, all of the lively rooms disappeared. When Sunsor has been stopped, now I'm, I mean, I'm just exaggerating. High fidelity is closed. I mean, how many people in this? So it's always a company-owned solution, which is a big issue whereby with OpenSIM, it's open source, and yes, there are companies hosting it, and there's Kitely and Artworld and Hypergrid um, and Target and Tokadia, and you name it, you name it, providers, um, but it's not the fear that this will disappear. It's almost like Moodle will be there because it's open sim. So this is why it's our number one. Uh, Outworlds, yes, another provider, yes, and it's our number one because of being so similar to Second Life, very flexible timing. And now I will pass over to the very person who uses Open Sim, Helena Galani, and she will be open before I still have to share the tri sider results. This is our top five. Number five, one, it's open thing. Number two is active worlds. Number three, like, and uh, top five, I have to look up. Yeah. Helena, over to you. Thank you very much for listening. Probably. Thank you. I hope you can hear me well, everyone. Hi, I'm Helena Bellani in real life. I've been a casual writer for Second Life. And on Kitely, I'm from. Um, I'm afraid we have not very good audio from you. Sorry. Is anybody else hearing the voice a little bit? Yes, I can hear you. 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 Yes
this out. No, it's just very sort of bandwidth wise, it seems quite good. Broken out, echoey, choppy, bit of distortion. You want to try it again, Helena? Yes. Um, sure. I hope you can hear me better. Is that any better now? If I put my sound a little. Hello? It I might settle. I mean, it seems bandwidth related, but it might settle. Go ahead. It is, it is breaking up a little bit, perhaps. Um, the, the line. Um, well, let me say a few things. First of all, um, I've been using uh, Kindly, uh, the island I have from Kindly is called ELT Treasure Island, and I use it especially for my younger learners um, because uh, it is a safer place to be. Sorry, 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 Helena, so it's not working. Uh, is there a chance you could let um, Annalisa go first because, truly speaking, her slides came first? Sure. And Okay, I, I was saying that uh, it's possible to use uh, many methodologies uh, um, working this board. For example, the problem solving, the learning by doing, uh, and the game-based uh, methodology. Uh, so it's a very uh, it's a way to to use uh, um, to work with the students uh, in uh, an interactive uh, way. Um, as uh, um, maybe you can see here, there are many words uh, where it's possible to learn, uh, to motivate uh, our students, uh, to include the students, uh, also the students uh, who have uh, who suffer of physical uh, problems or are fewer. Um, fewer abilities uh, uh, students. Uh, the students can cooperate when they are inside the world uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, um, strategy. Uh, they can uh, be creative, as you can see in this slide. Uh, this is uh, a word created by a math teacher, and she um, the students can build, can create objects, and also learn a very simple string of coding. Um, they also can play uh, role playing, can learn new vocabulary, new grammar structures, um, can create, can be very creative. So um, the teacher in this world, in the math world, um, compared the, the, the math, this subject, that is always very difficult for the students with uh, artistic works, uh, with paintings, uh, with uh, works um, taken by, by the heart. Um, also, it was possible uh, um, in another word that is called uh, Adderot. Please, can you go on with the slide? Yes, in Adderot, uh, the student uh, um, made uh, researchers uh, uh, research um, about uh, their uh, old city uh, that is called Mestre near Venice. Uh, because in the school there are a lot of immigrants uh, that uh, didn't know about the city, so this was a way uh, to make them uh, learn about uh, old, uh, um, old traditions, but also old places uh, of the city. So it was a way to share knowledge and to make the students uh, living in a more collaborative way. Uh, then uh, we can also see the, the slide that it's called the Beni Maplet. It is my uh, region, my land. Uh, I teach English so the students uh, can practice uh, storytelling, can practice uh, um, conversation, speaking, because there are many activities that they can do there. 
um, they can play games uh, like a memory game or um, other other amazing. For example, you can see in the slide, in the picture, there is a maze. Um, they can uh, open the doors uh, only if they answer to the correct questions about, uh, for example, grammar uh, structures. And uh, they also uh, can have conversation and uh, revise uh, lang the language. Uh, they can also build um, object, as I told you before, and make the, the object moving uh, thanks to uh, string strings of code because uh, inside there are uh, inside the object there are uh, uh, scripts. Uh, Coding, part of coding. So um, in Italy, um, teachers can make, uh, can develop their lessons in Word uh, because uh, they, um, they work with the students in uh, IT laboratories and the students uh, oh, can uh, access the words uh, without using their own uh, private uh, uh, account because they are enrolled by the teachers uh, with the teachers' uh, uh, accounts. So it's very, very safe and very useful and the students are always so excited and they like it a lot. And perhaps we can also listen to Helena, what she's been doing and what she was. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I hope you can hear me better now. Um, I find that projects is increasing likely for my young and teenage language learners are uh, indispensable. I use Second Life for adults, but I'd like to focus on Open Cinema tonight. And well, through the pedagogical approach, focus is placed on learning needs, diverse styles and modalities to provide a tailored model of education, as I see it. In virtual worlds, uh, especially open sim, which is a safe place for my younger learners, and it doesn't cost much to me to upload. It doesn't actually cost anything to upload my material. Um, I used a varied approach, which is more towards differentiated instruction. Whether I fit my classes, I blend them, or I teach online directly into OpenSync, um, with varied realistic but also not surreal activities, simulations, and game based instruction. We inspire learner creativity, lateral thinking, and non dogmatic differentiated instruction. My students are able to even build themselves, insert scripts in their, in their objects, and use tightly for language games, uh, self directed learning, scenario. Um, and, and, participation, taking part in scenarios, role plays, chatting with bots, and use it for quests, treasure hunts, and what they find particularly useful is machine gun making. Whether this material is available on a learning management, management system or strictly on OpenSIM, which is what I prefer, I prefer having a skybox for my students to go and practice for asynchronous learning or for synchronous learning in order to um, consolidate language such as structures, vocabulary, functions, or to develop learning skills and language skills such as speaking, writing, even writing. Uh, the starting point may be speaking, but it all ends up towards producing a uh, written paper because uh, most of these classes are exam orientated, mind you. All students are asked to take part in examinations, formal examinations, in order to prove their mastery of the language based on a um, 
Common European framework references reference for languages. Um, I've made available some pictures and the machine that you can find um, in the chat, I think, where you can go and look at some examples, some pictures of uh, my kindly uh, treasure island, EOT treasure island. Um, based on this little um, statistical um, research that we carried out, we realized that uh, OpenSIM is ideal for ages 10 to 16. It is quite rich in terms of material. And uh, there is a lot that students can create, as I said before, not only the teacher. Also, the marketplace um, offers a variety of material that can be used. In order to save time, uh, it doesn't compare to the preferred of material available on the second life in the marketplace, but that needs a lot of filtering, and I can't get younger students in. It's impossible. I need them to be um, safer and protected. Um, second, I find open simulator and kindly not cheaper. For me, it only costs around about 14 to 15 US dollars a month for one sim, for one, sim, for one island. For my students, it's, it's completely free. And PSCs can be programmed as chatbots. And uh, the, the point uh, being the issue is that if you decide to have a form a type of a tech, then that's going to have to be handmade. And um, it's, yes, uh, it is um, a non commercial um, sort of island as I use it. I don't know if, if you use kindly, anybody in our audience, do you use kindly? Could you type in if you do? How many of you? Use kindly for their lessons. Nobody? There are a lot of islands. You do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How? Well, lovely. There are lots of islands, especially for language teaching purposes. And you can have multiplayer or single player scenario. And you can adjust the control and the, you can control the access of your students into these worlds. For me, using um, OpenSync kindly for young students um, promotes self directed learning. Students become more self aware and self motivated. They develop a critical reflection towards their learning. They also develop decision making skills, metacognitive strategies, become more independent, they take risks as learners. Self direction in learning reflects, refers to both the external characteristics of an instructional process and the internal characteristics of the learner, where the individual assumes primary responsibility for a learning experience. As Brockett and Hamster have cited, I'm citing Brockett and Hamster 1991 here. Thank you um, so much. Um, I know that we're running out of time, and uh, yeah, we're having a little bit problems listening to you because of the bit of broken voice, but thanks to Jazz, who's been pasting some of the text in the text. Thank you, Jazz. You've been doing a wonderful job today. Thank you. This is very useful. And, and let's give, uh, um, and now we should be leaving this venue soonish because the next um, yes. I'm so going to pass the floor over to the next person. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm very happy if you join us on AP Nation which is our language learning community, and we're thankful to Virtual Best Practices in Education that they made it possible for this second year now already a wonderful cooperation whereby we have a B-language strand.
in virtual world is practicing education.